Given a second chance, the Dallas Mavericks handled their business in LA, notching themselves a 96-93 victory to even the series at one game apiece, despite Kawhi Leonard's return to the starting lineup. I'll have all that and more after the bumper. There's really no other way of putting it. The Mavericks had to win game two. I'm not going to say that the Clippers have a great history defending 2-0. I'm not going to say the Mavericks have an advantage of that position necessarily either. What I am saying is that given where we thought these two teams were, how evenly matched we felt they were, and the fact that LA did not have Kawhi Leonard in game one, this was essential. Really, both of these teams can say they got exactly what they needed in these first two games. For the Clippers, yes, Kawhi Leonard returned to the lineup last night. For the Mavericks, you had to get a series split in LA, in these first two games in LA. Mavericks got what they needed. The Clippers did just enough because they got a win without Kawhi. So both of them effectively did what they had to do. Technically, Dallas does own the home court advantage now as the series turns towards Dallas for Game 3, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Let's talk about what happened in this game, how Dallas responded to what I can only classify as a disastrous Game 1 performance, and how the Mavericks managed to claw and scratch their way back into this series. Now look, I'll be honest with you, I have some real legitimate concerns through the first couple of games here as it relates to two particular role players I thought would be huge for Dallas. First of all, my X Factor, Dante Exum, has been a non-factor in these first two games. He only plays six minutes last night, 0 of 1 from the field, uh, just not able to do much. He's not bothering Harden. So looking at 2018 and thinking, hey, Harden's a step slower, this will more so help Dante? Mm, so far, not so much. Now, I did say role players play better at home, but man, he's got to have a complete 180. Speaking of a necessary 180, Daniel Gafford put up the missing posters. Nine minutes for the Mavericks starting center, 0 of 3. So he is now 1 of 7 from the field through the first two games. Keep in mind, this was the guy who led the NBA in field goal percentage. Keep in mind, this is the guy who made 33 straight baskets at one point and then like 24 straight in a separate streak a few games later. The dude feasted around the basket. Tough finishers, good touch, good timing on alley-oops. It has not been there in this game. He has been thoroughly out Class. Now, the good thing for Dallas, despite those two struggles, they did have some fortune break their way. Some other guys did wake up, namely P.J. Washington. Now, I'm not going to say it was a perfect performance from P.J. Washington, but you get 18 points out of P.J. Washington in 35 minutes. That's some good lifting. That's some good work. And he had timely three-pointers in the fourth quarter, too, in like the latter half of the fourth quarter, where he's hitting corner threes that are just huge for Dallas to hang around and to, to continue first clawing their way back in. At one point, Dallas found themselves down six and then rattled off a 14-0 run to flip the script in this game. Fortunately, never looked back. But P.J. was huge during that run. You love all of that. There were other moments as well where he didn't really cleanly gather the ball in like an alley-oop pass. And instead of getting a key basket that probably forces a clipper timeout, Instead, it allows momentum to kind of settle and your chance to knock them back on their heels kind of settles down. There were some moments like that for PJ. But overall, I feel like push came to shove. He delivered when you needed him to. And I always give respect and credit to guys that are able to put behind them any mistakes or stumbles they might have had earlier in the game and respond in a big, big moment. Exum has done that a few times this year in the regular season. I'm waiting to see if he can do it in the postseason as well. Now, in addition to that, Derek Jones Jr. had a much better game as well. 10 points for him, uh, seven rebounds as well. I like seeing that. Four of six from the field, again, much better. Him and PJ were 
basically just ghosts in the first game. The, the hustle and defense and effort was there. I'm not trying to diminish them on that. But they just had nothing going for them offensively. So for them to both respond last night, I felt like, with good games was huge. In game one, P.J. Washington was the only non-Maverick to score in double figures. And he had 11. So for him to have 18 and Derek Jones Jr. to have 10, that's pretty solid. You also get seven off the bench from Derek Lively. 21 minutes from him, again, partly because Gafford. Gafford only had two fouls. He just was struggling to find his footing. But Lively, I felt, was a little more settled in this game, made some good plays, did a much better job of catching, uh, timing his jump for alley-oops, gathering the ball in general, and was able to finish through um, you know, a little bit of traffic and noise. That's good. I love that response from Lively. And uh, Maxi Kleba, you know, I know he's one of those guys that he doesn't catch Dwight Powell heat, but he catches a lot of heat from Maverick fans the last two, three years. This was a very good game from Maxi defensively. The numbers aren't going to pop. You're not going to look at it and say like, oh man, Maxi Kleba, turn on. It's not his eight three-pointer game against Utah two years ago. Let's be clear. However, yes, six points. He's two of three from three. Uh, he does get you six boards as well. His defense is so vital, and he hits a huge three with just a couple minutes left as well. I felt like Maxi really had one of those games, kind of like I talked about that last regular season win against Miami being like, hey, this is a moment that Maxi's value really shines through. It won't show up in the box score, so if you're just watching Twitter, if you're just watching the highlights, you're not going to see a whole lot of it and be like, yes, Maxi was a major factor here. But he's going to do a lot of very sound, fundamental things, and he's going to help put his team in position. Not always. To be clear, there are moments where it's ugly. At this stage of his career with his you know, history of back issues and all that, that's just the reality of it. But this was one of those high-value Maxi games. So it's good that Dallas was able to handle its business. Maxi deserves a lot of credit. 28 minutes, great job from him. Um, another noteworthy thing, Tim Hardaway Jr. only plays six minutes, 0 of 1 from the field. He comes down on Paul George's foot, shooting a three-pointer, rolls his right ankle, does not return to the game. So that might be something to watch. I'm not going to say if that's a positive or a negative with how he shot in game one. And, you know, he only got one shot attempt in game two. We can't say. But that is something to watch because, yes, a guy that catches a lot of flack, a lot of slander, I get it. I partake in it at times. But you are talking about a guy who, if Dallas gets just that bonus, just like this was a bonus performance out of Maxi, where it's like, oh, dang, you're getting a good performance from Maxi. You need to capitalize on this. This gives you a chance that you can't anticipate. But if it's there, you better seize it. Same thing is true of a Tim Hardaway game. If a Tim Hardaway game is dropping buckets, you better find a way to cash that check because if you don't, man, it's going to be a long time till your next payday. So you need to get your you need to get your wins if Hardaway is in a groove. Him being out, hopefully he's back now with a little bit of extended rest. Hopefully it's nothing major. Couldn't really tell on the replay, but I will note Paul George did injure Daniel Gafford in Game One. Uh, body checking him coming down the floor, Gafford kind of buckled in an awkward way and the ankle rolled. He did come back, but was total non-factor in that game and this game. So now I'm looking at it and saying like, oh, Paul George has effectively injured two Maverick role players in the span of two games, both of which with, uh, I believe, right ankles. So I don't know. Interesting. I know he kind of is their, their enforcer type guy, especially with them not trying to push Kawhi too hard right now. But I am kind of looking at that. I don't feel like either was dirty. You could maybe argue the first one with Gafford, but I feel like that's playoff basketball. I'm not going to be too hard about that. This one kind of drifting into Hardaway's space. I'm a little more mm, on, but I also understand defenders are put in a nearly impossible situation night in, night out when you're trying to contest and play good defense, and uh, you just don't get a chance for it. Speaking of which, Josh Green knows a thing or two about that because Harden is uh, such a miraculous foul merchant that he's able to flail and force whistles even when there is virtually nothing there. Again, drawing a crucial foul where he gets three free free throws. And when you're getting that kind of whistle for Harden, but then Kyrie's getting 
murdered going to the into the paint multiple times a game but not getting any whistles Kyrie didn't shoot his first free throws of the game until like nine seconds left when he was fouled and put at the line he ended up shooting four free throws because he makes the first misses the second Dallas fortunately Maxi, by the way gets an offensive rebound gets it back to Kyrie who again gets fouled goes to the line makes both that's all well and good that's great but the fact that Kyrie goes into the paint as much as he does, the fact that he finishes as great as he does in the paint among the trees, again, had some baskets in this game that were just otherworldly. But he doesn't get foul calls. He doesn't go to the line hardly ever. It is miraculous that a guy of that caliber, a unquestioned superstar, can't get whistles. Kyrie and James Harden do not have the same whistle tendencies from officials and uh it definitely shows in a game like last night also am i crazy or is there a little bit of animosity there maybe with the way things went in brooklyn especially because it was harden that blew that up that attempted big three that only played 17 games together is there a little bit of resentment there from Kyrie? maybe i don't know i kind of felt like there was a little extra animosity between these guys watching them go at each other last night now luca this this to me is the story of this game. Luca played his ass off defensively. And he does not get near enough credit. With Luca as the primary defender last night. I want to pull this up here. This is from ESPN Stats and Info. The Clippers were 2 of 17 from the floor last night when Luca was the primary defender. James Harden had three points, one of five. Terrence Mann, zero points, O of two. Norman Powell, zero points, O of two. Kawhi Leonard, zero points, O of two. Mason Plumley, zero points, O of two. Amir Coffey, two points, one of one. Hey, hey, 100%. Russell Westbrook, zero points, O of one. Zubats, zero points, O of one. Two of 17 with Luka guarding them as the primary defender. There was a moment in the fourth quarter where Dallas, as they tend to do, overhelped to Luka's side. Um, the ball kicks around. The rotation is a little bit slow. Russell Westbrook, again, of all people, knocks down a three. And I want to say this is like with six minutes left in the game. Luka screaming at his teammates to stop helping him, to stop helping on his man, on his rotation. And from that point on, Luca went ISO. And he was locking down Kawhi. He was locking down Harden. He was locking down anybody that came his way. That point on, Luca didn't give up anything the rest of the way. And yet, that's not a conversation piece from what I've seen so far in the national media. Kind of amazing. Like, even Russell Westbrook got a lot of love and credit with their game one performance with his defense. And by the way, he had a great performance of a similar nature. But he got the love. He got that focus of like, hey, all these guys struggled against him, including Luka. So there you go. Russell Westbrook, when he's dialed in, his defense is just otherworldly and there's like nothing you can do about it. Well, here's an instance where you got that performance out of Luka, a top three MVP candidate, a guy who carries more baggage and takes more slander than probably anyone in this series. And he does it. And it's just like, ah, it was just a bad offensive night for the Clippers, man. They held the Clippers under 100 points. And it wasn't even a pretty offensive game from the Mavericks. Like, you still had struggles when it came to some of these role players, some of this timely baskets. Again, some of these baskets in this pull away in that, in that pivotal moment in the fourth quarter where Dallas is down six and it kind of feels like it's in a dangerous spot. And then Dallas responds with a 14-0 run. During that push... Dallas is able to pull those percentages up, but you're still looking at a situation where Dallas, it, its role players weren't doing a tremendous job yet. PJ hits a couple of his threes, so he gets to 18, but he was in a similar territory offensively, kind of to the first game, the first performance a little bit, in terms of points at least. And so this was a huge, a huge thing here where it's like Dallas, you could say, didn't even play its best. They're having role players, multiple role players, who you expect to do well, who have not done well yet. So why are we giving credit only one direction here? So in this game, Dallas shoots 42% from the field, holds LA to 37%. That is huge defensive masterclass effort, swarming effort, 
uh, great job by this team. I know Chuck Cooperstein said on Twitter after the game this might have been the best defensive effort performance he's seen from the Mavericks in his time calling games, which obviously means they're not just the championship year, but you know, 20 some odd years of that. That's a huge statement. I don't know if I can quantify it to that extent, but I will say the defensive effort, the adjustments by Jason Kidd, I credit where it's due. Again, Jason Kidd responded well. The adjustments, the rotational decisions, much, much better in game two. You also held LA sub 30% from three. They were 27%, eight of 30. Again, this was 80, uh, this was what, 16 of 32 in game one, 50% that they shot. Incredible from them in game one. And I said, that was really the difference of the game. That second quarter, as horrific as it was for the Mavericks, as unmerciless as it was for them. And even with some bad rotational decisions, by Jason Kidd, particularly in that fourth quarter when they kind of started to make a little bit of a run to try and make a one more go at it. Even with all of that, you still had a chance to get game one if it's not for the Clippers shooting 50% from three, being like a plus 30 or whatever it was from three in that game. This game, the Clippers shot 40% as a team from the se for the season. So it's not like you could say that was a total fluke but it was being especially on. They played about as well offensively game one as they could have, even in Kawhi's absence. Kawhi comes back, you know, 15 points I think he had. Um, let me see here, actually, I can look this up real quick. Yeah, Kawhi, 15 points, seven rebounds, and two assists. Also had four steals and a block. So good, but he was a minus eight for the game for what that's worth. So Dallas responding and the Clippers falling all the way back to earth with a 27% outing on just eight made threes. Dallas was 42% for that matter, uh, 14 of 33. And let me see, who had, I'm curious here, who had the most threes? Luca had five, Kai had four, PJ Washington uh, had three, and Maxi had two. That's it. So PJ Washington and Maxi combined for five. Luca and Kai were the other nine. So as I said, three-point shooting, your superstars gave it to you. You still didn't get enough from your role players on that, but you, you do what you can. Free throws virtually even, but Dallas playing with its food way too much, only 67%, 18 of 27. I don't love that. One of those finally broke your way when Kai misses the second free throw. That would have put Dallas up. It would have put Dallas up four, I believe, but he misses it. But Maxi gets the offensive board on Kawhi, no less, and then gets the ball to Kyrie, who draws another foul, sinks both. So that puts you in the position to close it out. But just great. Dallas in the first half was pretty sloppy with the ball. I think 10 turnovers in the first half. Ended the game with 13, though, so I loved that adjustment, how they kind of settled in. Dallas does win the rebounding battle in this game, 50-47, to 47, although the Clippers do win the offensive glass, 14-11. to 11. Blocks, seven again for Dallas. So nine in the first game, seven in the second game. Love that. Love the fact that, again, they had eight steals. They're doing very, very good things defensively in terms of protecting the paint, in terms of protecting the rim, and uh, just wreaking havoc. Love all of that. And, uh, you know, for me, this game, this, this was huge. Not just because you needed to win this game to, to feel like you had a chance. And you already were reeling a little bit after blowing your opportunity in game one without Kawhi in for the, for the Clippers. But you also were trying to get your role players a little bit more confident. I think PJ is going to be much better off now for how he closed this game and how he performed. I think Derek Jones Jr. will be better off for this. I'm not going to lie. I am worried about Gafford at this point. Now that it's a couple games like this. As invincible as he seemed, like you, you saw the shots he was making, left falling on his ass shot against Miami when he's already like he's already has his streak of made shots again at like 20, 22, 23. And then he throws that one up, falling on his ass. And you're just like, dude, when that drops, it just shows that like you're fearless. You, you're not worried at all. You could, you could throw it over your shoulder from half court and drain it, it feels like. That invincibility feels like it's gone to the opposite extreme now where it's like, okay, do we have to worry about this being in his head that he was so bad in game one and made so no impact? 13 minutes, I think it was, game one that he got. 
uh, nine minutes in this game. I did not entail this being a series where Gafford would not be able to get minutes, where he would be virtually unplayable. That actually does scare me. So that's something to keep an eye on. And uh, I mentioned before, I need to see something from Dante. I still think he's a potential X factor for this series, but through two games, dude's, dude's asleep out there. In his last 50 playoff games, Kawhi's averages were 30 points, 8.7 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists. So the fact that Kawhi plays in this game, even though, again, with this particular incarnation of L.A., he doesn't have to do as much heavy lifting, still huge to have a guy like that out there and to be able to gut out the win, especially on the road. So I love, love, love Dallas getting this back and feeling like they're kind of slaying some demons here. It's not just that. I talked about Luka and his defense. Again, forcing turnovers, blocking shots, walking up their best player at times. The defense he played on that one possession for Kawhi, masterful. It just shows when Luka really buckles down and wants it, he can absolutely defend. He can defend. I'm not going to call him a, a, a world-beating defender. I'm not going to call him an all-NBA defensive player. That, that would be you know, excessive. Can he, for one play, lock a dude up or for a handful of plays, slow a dude down? Absolutely. I just feel like Luka puts all of his focus on the offensive end, which, by the way, makes him the same as 90% of the star players in the NBA. There's only a handful of them that really have that hunger to be truly great on both sides of the, on both sides of the ball there. So I mentioned earlier after Russell Westbrook hits that three in the fourth quarter, Luka telling his teammates to stop helping him defensively. After that, he went ISO defense against Kawhi, Paul George, and Harden. Multiple possessions down the stretch. And uh, didn't give up anything to them. Not a point. And he hits that clutch three that puts Dallas up nine with about 86 seconds left. By the way, we could have a conversation about that. Dallas going up nine with a minute 26 and still nearly pissing the game away. LA gets it down to three points. And then a near disaster happens on the inbounds play. Luka gets the ball in the, the dead man's corner. He's got two baselines trapping him. Double teams coming. He drives baseline under the basket, nearly stepping out of bounds, throws an incredibly dangerous bounce pass. He does get it to Kyrie, but the ball bounces just beyond the fingertip reach of Terrence Mann. And it's like, dude... They were down three with like 13 seconds left, and you're almost giving them the ball at the three-point line. Like, a little part of me had a heart attack there thinking like, oh, this is going to be what just happened to Philadelphia, isn't it? Like, it's that kind of mess up right now. I, I would have absolutely swallowed my tongue at that point had that happened. I, I would be out of here. Game over, DDP. But fortunately, again, we talk about Game one, the ball had several bad bounces for Dallas. Game two, had some very advantageous ones. Kyrie's second missed free throw, falling into Maxi's hands, him getting it back to Kyrie, who then makes up for it by making two free throws. So you get three points when you're only expecting two. Then you have this play here, just barely, just enough accent on the ball, just enough flick of the wrist to zip it past Terrence Mann's hands, and that saves you from... Sheer disaster, I think. Because I think if LA gets a turnover there, you're in so, so serious trouble. Uh, so, fortunately, things break right for you. I will say this. Luka's decision-making, which we talk about, we rave about how you really cannot stop Luka. You can't game plan or shut him down or anything like that. You can't really throw double teams at him because he sees everything and he processes everything so fast, so well. You're just helpless sometimes and so sometimes the best thing you can do is just go solo and even if it means hey Luca's gonna get his ask Atlanta about that when he goes for 73 earlier this year because they send no double teams at him all game and then instead the narrative is that the state of defense is just garbage in the NBA and look what they're allowing Luca to do it's not even an impressive stat they say whatever the Clippers are doing something here that it's doing just enough to throw Luca off his decision making has been a bit sus if I'm honest here, through the first couple games. Not just that pass that he gets away with, but he's, he's, he only had three turnovers, so I don't want to like rant and rave as if he had a horrible game 
in terms of his decision making. But you are seeing him make certain errors, even at certain critical junctures, that he doesn't typically make. And you see him getting frustrated more easily. I don't just think that's how his teammates are playing. I know everyone wanted to point to game one, him yelling at uh, Maxi when he didn't even really attempt to catch that pass right under the basket. I know what they're talking about on that. But I think Luca's frustrated because he is having more thrown at him than usual. It is doing just a little bit to make it more difficult for him. And he does have to lean on his teammates a little bit more than usual to, to execute and to capitalize on that so that it doesn't you know, sink them. And he's getting just enough. Kyrie is Kyrie. Kyrie had uh, 23 points in the game, six rebounds, three assists, eight of 18 from the field, four of eight from three. Three or four at the line, again, getting those all those free throws in the last like 13 seconds. I do feel like I would be remiss if I didn't give Kyrie credit for his defense tonight. I actually did think he he played well defensively. Some good baskets here. I, I love some of the impossible shots he hits. I just think especially when Luca is getting this frustrated as we saw at times, you have to kind of like protect him from himself a little bit because we know Luka can zero in so much, and this happens to a lot of guys, uh, a lot of star players. You can get so focused on destroying someone yourself that you, you don't play as smart. Now, Luka generally does a pretty good job of that, but we have seen times in the playoffs in the past where he becomes so focused on annihilating you himself that it's not always the right play or he's forcing the issue a little bit too much. So, looking at all of this, what are my takeaways? The Mavericks with this win are now, until yesterday I believe it was, road teams had yet to win in the NBA playoffs. The Mavericks did win, obviously. I think technically the Pacers got Milwaukee first, so I think technically uh, Indiana was the first road team to win a playoff game this year, but Dallas is the second team on the road to win a playoff game. It's been hard sledding. It's been really, really tough. But you know what? It just makes it all the sweeter that you were able to earn the split, that you were able to make the adjustments, kid managing the rotation well. And I, I'd even mention this. I talked about in game one, kid having a terrible decision not to make a critical challenge. He had a brilliant challenge in like the closing minutes of this game. Might've been the closing minute. I don't remember the exact timestamp. Kyrie Irving looks to commit a just mind-bogglingly bad foul. Like he's, LA has a good bead. Uh, Kyrie's beaten to the basket. All he has to do is like, okay, it's, it's done at this point. Just don't, don't foul. Just let it be two. Don't let it be worse. They get the foul call. It is called an and one. Kid challenges, obviously knowing like, look, I can't take away that it's a basket, but we can deny them the free throw. And to my amazement, when the officials review the play, they actually do see that is true. Kyrie only contacts the ball, does not hit the offensive player, and thus it's two points, not three. I felt like that was a huge pendulum swing in Dallas' favor in that moment. So, kid, now I get it, right? Like, you're like, you've been holding on to the challenge all game. If you're not going to use it now, when are you going to use it? I get that. But at the same time... That is, that is a huge play there, and to have that wherewithal and for it to actually break Dallas's way. Closing standout moments here, P.J. Washington with 10 fourth quarter points. Again, for a guy with 18, that means that the fourth quarter is where he stood out. A little bit ho-hum in terms of the offensive end up until that point, but comes up huge. Maxi hitting a timely three, that's huge. Luka and Kyrie closing this game as superstar tandems absolutely must. That's huge. And uh, they only committed one turnover in the fourth quarter. So that's, that's big. Uh, you protect the ball, you handle your business, and you also got some key offensive rebounds, as Mark Followell points out. That's why Dallas is able to flip the script there in the fourth quarter, take what was a six-point deficit. Yeah, the 14-0 run powered them to a nice lead, but then they are able to close it out because they just keep doing the fine details well. Followell also points out that as far as just looking at opponent percentage, like field goal percentage in a game, this game against the Clippers is among the best postseason games defensively in Mavericks history. Just looking at purely field goal percentage. So you could look at that and say, 
All right, so you basically won by three in a game where your defense was stellar and you held your opponent under 100. Is that concerning? I would say the three-point deficit's a little misleading because it was really six. Paul George just hits a, a you know, stat-padding three as the buzzer sounds. So you basically won by six. Again, you had several guys not playing up to your top level. You, you never apologize for winning. I don't care the circumstances. You never apologize for winning. And the fact that this team is able to win games in which they don't have everything going right for them, they don't have the, st uh, the role players playing like they want, they've struggled at times with managing the physicality that the Clippers play with, and they're a damn good defensive team. Luka is a little bit more bothered than usual. They're, they're throwing the sink at him, and it is doing just enough to bother him and kind of get under his skin, which at times makes him play to a almost superhuman level. But in this series so far, I do feel like has him kind of walking that line between just annihilate everything and dangerous, like self-destructive a little bit. So I'm a little bit concerned about that, especially as this series wears on, because if we get to a point where this is a, you know, two games to one or a 2-2 two -two series and it's a game five, I do worry is composure going to get there because tension will rise. This is where I think Kai's leadership in particular is so, so critical for this team. They'll feed on Luka's energy and his just killer mentality, but they also need that steady hand who cannot just be the assassin himself, but can also kind of hold things together, keep his team focused and composed, and just not losing sight of the little things that will ultimately decide this series. Tim McMahon points out, Luka Doncic had 32 points, 9 assists, and perhaps the best defensive performance of his career, regular season or postseason, to lead the Mavericks to a series-tying 96-93 win in a Game 2 brawl in L.A. I think that's fair. I think that is fair to say that you look at his defensive performance alone. I, I talked about it earlier. Two of 17 is what he held the opposing team to. Didn't matter who he was facing. Whether he was facing Kawhi Leonard, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, whether he was facing Paul George, whether he was facing Norman Powell, Zubats, like he held it down. But that pretty much wraps up this Maverick win. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, leave a comment, uh, like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace! From Prospect to Legend!